Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Welcome to the Getty Center. Um, my name is Disby Gensler. I'm a research associate and public programming specialist at the Getty Research Institute. And I'm delighted to be introducing today's program, The Sound of Your Voices Home, Yasmin Nasser Diaz in conversation with Ikram Lakhtar. I had the pleasure of seeing Yasmin Diaz's multimedia work, The Sound of Your Voice's Home, installed at Reflect Space Gallery in the Glendale Central Library in the summer of 2022. This immersive soundscape offered a beautiful meditation on the ineffable nature of home, a notion divorced from time or space, but powerfully located in the voices of loved ones. Inspired by the exchange of cassette recordings between her family and relatives in Chicago and Yemen in early childhood, Though here largely comprised of contemporary WhatsApp messages, this collage of voicemails from the formal to the inane invites us to, into an intimate private communion that somehow feels universal and tenderly documents the evolving ways diasporic communities maintain connectivity and share memories. Yasmin's work frequently occupies the domestic sphere to explore the boundaries of cultural identity staging familial memories and nostalgic recreations of home that nod to both tradition and technological change and are often deftly punctured by powerful feminist and social critique. She mines her personal archive to probe the nuances of third culture identity, that is, the unique space that children of immigrants occupy in a new country, in a stunning variety of media, from collage and fiber etching to video and immersive assemblage. Sitting in a replica of her childhood kitchen, filled with the scent of spices and the unmistakable click of the answering machine, I was moved to invite Yasmin to the Getty to put her work in dialogue with the GRI's annual scholar theme, Art and Migration. This year's cohort of scholars and residents have been conducting research focused on the questions of memory and cultural heritage, provenance and repatriation, and the complex lives of movable objects, traditions, and practices. Helping us to examine these themes through Yasmin's work today, I'm also thrilled to introduce our moderator, Ikram Lakhtar. Ikram is a Tunisian-born, LA-based curator and writer whose practice seeks to decolonize the canon of art history and expand transnational narratives with a focus on the global south. She is the curator of the exhibition Water, Trespassing Liquid Highways at Gallery 102, which examined the entanglements of race, gender, climate and mass migrations in the Caribbean and Mediterranean seas. She's the co-founding editor of DIRT, a platform for inclusive arts discourse, and has published essays with The Chart, Common Field, Arts, arts Black, and Be More Art. Following their conversation, we will invite everyone to the GRI. We are hosting a reception featuring Yemeni honeycomb bread, tea, other treats and refreshments, and we'll have stations set up for you to write letters to your own family and friends. A full video recording of The Sound of Your Voice's Home will be playing on loop there, so you can watch it in its entirety. And finally, you'll have the opportunity to record your own messages that Yasmin may use in a future iteration of this project. So before I begin, I want to first acknowledge our presence today on the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva people and pay our respects to these groups, past, present, and emerging. And lastly, some housekeeping. While today's program is being recorded and will be on YouTube soon, we ask that you please not videotape today's conversation and please silence all your cell phones at this time. So without further ado, please enjoy this clip from The Sound of Your Voice is Home. Baby, you don't have a gun. I love you. Come on, come on. I love you. You don't have a gun. I miss you, love. Bye bye. The cassettes that we would get from Yemen, because especially in Yaffa, in the village, there weren't any telephones. So people would record on cassettes. And my memory is sitting around the kitchen table and my mom bringing out the cassette player and playing it for us all to hear. And we'd all have to be quiet and listen. And it would always be either from her mom or her siblings. And half the time we didn't know what they were saying. <laughs> but they would always start the same way. Salam alaikum, of course. And then 
al akh or al bint, like basically whoever the person is, then they would start describing that person uh, like in a poetic way, uh, for instance, al bint Qamar, bint Saleh, Nasa, you know, bint Saleh, Muhammad, um, and she would like say the whole name, you know, dad's name, dad's dad's name, and then she would say, البنت العيون القلب الروح الشمس whatever like basically describing her to the sun her eyes um, her soul and just be a whole five minutes introduction at the same time she'll be hushing people in the background saying سكت سكت I'm recording I'm you know like I'm recording be quiet and then all of a sudden حبيبتي وقلبي and my mom would make us do recordings as well And we were all little kids. No, I don't know what to say. No, mom, shut up. You know, like we would all shy away from doing it, but we would eventually do it. She would make everybody at least say something. She'd always put us on the spot. And she still does that till today. If she's on the phone with someone. Here, here, no, I want to talk to you. And even though I'm just looking at her like, no, I never said that. <laughs> That's uh, something that I think all Yafai mothers do to their daughters or kids if they're in the same room or even around them. They find them somehow and force them to be on the phone to talk to people. That's a matter of how can I make a magic bedia? We try to show them that we're not zanan in them. Hello, so what have you been? We have to do this again, huh? We have to do this. 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 My mom, when she went to Yemen, when my grandfather was was really sick, um, it was a long trip for her. And it was as long as my mom had been away from my father. And when in the day to day between my mom and my dad, you know, we get one sense of what the relationship is like. It's usually it's like very like short and curt. And, but on this trip, my mom had sent my dad a cassette. And it was really an eye opener into their relationship because I remember um, being outside of my outside of the bedroom, my dad's bedroom, and hearing my dad play it, that cassette over and over and over again. Just I, I remember it gave me and my sisters a pause just to see that sentimental side of my dad and that tender side. My <laughs> My Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Um, really grateful for your presence. Uh, and thank you so much, Yasmin, for your brilliant work. I'd like to also thank Thisbe for the wonderful invitation and for uh, your brilliance and your vision as well. Um, Yasmin, I'm really uh, honored to be in conversation with you. I've been uh, a longtime fan of your work. I know um, when I first saw your work, it has made me, made me feel seen and, and heard, and I'm just really uh, excited for more people to be able to feel that way uh, here at the Getty today. Um, so yeah, with that, I would love to kind of get into a little bit of uh, more about hearing more about your work here. And uh, and before we we do that, um, in your multimedia work, you're building an affective uh, world for and by the uh, Southwest Asian and North African diaspora, which is uh, referred to as SWANA. Uh, and so uh, we're using this term uh, SWANA in lieu of the Islamic world or the Arab world or the Middle East uh, as a decolonial framework, uh, which speaks more to the diversity of our communities and to be more intentional about the liberation uh, of the most vulnerable. Uh, Yasmin, to create the sound of your voice is home, which we just saw a clip of today, uh, you are turning um, 
communications between distant loved ones into an immersive soundscape, uh, hence documenting the ways in which uh, diasporic communities maintain connectivities. Uh, and so can you tell us a little bit about how, what inspired you to create this work? Yeah, um, first of all, thank you all so much for coming. It really means a lot that you took the time to be here today. Um, I'll start with the installation, which, as you mentioned, is um, a, a loose recreation of my family's kitchen in the house that we lived in for most of my childhood. Um, and this is in Chicago in a neighborhood called Albany Park, which is on the northwest side. And something I learned about Albany Park recently, actually, is that it's one of the most ethnically diverse neighborhoods in the country. And geographically, it's not a huge area at all, but there's over 40 languages spoken in the public schools there. And that didn't surprise me to learn at all because that's exactly how it felt. It's a very immigrant heavy neighborhood, very working class. And that's where my parents ended up when they immigrated from Yemen. Both of my parents are from uh, a region called Yaffa in the Southern Highlands. And um, as you heard uh, my sister describe, uh, most of the houses did not have landlines. So our family house in Yaffa didn't have a landline. And you know, there was one house like within a cluster that did and we could, our relatives could sometimes use it, but um, you know, you had to have an actual live operator connecting the calls, which sounds so ancient to say, but you know, that wouldn't always, they wouldn't always go through. And, and even when they did, you know, long distance calls were really expensive and there's a huge time difference. So they just didn't happen often. So when we would learn about another family in the neighborhood planning a trip to Yemen, we would gather to make these cassette tapes. Mm -hmm. And basically these were like really long group voice memos and we would go around and, you know, give updates on who was getting married or, you know, who was having a baby or how the kids are doing in school. And, you know, later on uh, in the recording, you hear another sister of mine um, mention how strange it felt to be addressing relatives that we never met, which was usually the case, but also how she now reflects back fondly on that. And I realize it's like how special it was to do that. And that sentiment is something that you'll hear echo throughout a lot of these messages. People, you know, um, just speaking to how their relationship with the past has changed. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's like the past is the past. It's not something that we can change, but our, our relationship to it does. Our own memories actually change. And so that's, that's something that's kind of at the core of this. And um, I learned a few years ago that we no longer have these cassette tapes, which is such a shame. And um, now, of course, you know, we're all using smartphones and yeah. communicating, you know, via all the apps and WhatsApp, which is like the app of, you know, diaspora, you right. know, <laughs> staying in touch with family. And any one of us has like thousands of messages on our phones. But like, it's really overwhelming to think about stopping and saving any of these, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that just kind of like thinking about the lost tapes, like made me think of like how ephemeral all these messages are. And this is just, you know, the total audio is 13 minutes, but at least those 13 minutes are saved. And, and the way the installation was situated in the room, it was kind of uh, just really encouraging people to pause and sit and listen. Like mm -hmm. in, the, in the photo of it, it looks very bright, but the room it was in was quite dark. Um, surrounding that area and it's surrounded by benches. So it kind of just forces you to like slow down and, and listen. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think this work really propels us to think through how the sto these stories migrate across oceans and across cultures and time and, and space. Um, the, the clip we just heard a, a little bit of features 14 contributors uh, speaking multiple dialects of Arabic and Farsi, uh, Cantonese and English. And you have translated all of those um, sound bites into English and projected it on the kitchen wall. Uh, and so, you know, I'd love to know more about the kind of care that you put into uh, shaping this this work um, and how how did how did it take shape? Yeah, so the bulk of the work for the project was editing the audio 
and getting it translated and transcribing it into subtitles. So I started by putting a call out to some family and friends. I posted on Instagram and um, I didn't necessarily set out for this to be a Swana heavy project, but apparently <laughs> those are the people in my life that are receptive to my let's just call it loving harassment. Uh, so <laughs> thank you to those friends. But um, so I explained the project and I offered two categories of submissions. One being messages that were recorded specifically for this project, like the one you heard my sister talking. And I just asked people to either talk about uh, some kind of family tradition or something related to ways that they stayed in touch with relatives uh, who they were separated from uh, by distance. And the other category is uh, were just actual voice messages that were on people's phones. And I didn't limit you know, people with those. I just said, just send whatever you, know, you, you wanna send. And um, when I started receiving the messages and listening to them, it really dawned on me like, what a privilege it is when people are willing to contribute to a project like this. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are often really deeply personal messages. You know, the voicemails are, were never intended for anybody else to hear. And mm -hmm. so I really wanted to honor that generosity and that trust. And I spent a lot of time listening to the messages over and over again and just, you know, being intentional about like what clips to include. And, um, and I really got obsessively into that part. Um, and then there was the translating, which I um, started with uh, by using a software, a, a translating software that also uh, transcribes into subtitles. Um, it's called Veed and it's pretty bad. Like I would say the accuracy was like 50, <laughs> 60%. So, but it helped to start with that. And then I hired some friends to help with the translating. Like, wow. um, I, my Arabic is not that great, but I did some of that editing, but mostly it was other friends that helped. And that was a new process to me. And really just, I had a newfound respect for people that work in that area because it's, it became obvious very quickly how there's no such thing as a perfect translation. You know, mm -hmm. it's like if you don't have a deep understanding of a culture, there are certain words and phrases you're never gonna understand because mm -hmm. just culture and language are just so intertwined. And um, uh, one, one great example is, I mean, especially poetry. So the last clip in the full length is a poem that my friend Muhammad's dad uh, is reciting to him in a voicemail. And he said that his dad always reads poetry to him. Aww. I know, it's so sweet. It's like sometimes he'll tell a story of something that happened to him that day and he'll read a bit of poetry that relates uh, to, that, um, to that anecdote. And um, this poem that he read was by a medieval Persian poet and, you know, I mean, like trans, so I, I looked it up and I found this YouTube channel that is dedicated to like dissecting Persian poetry. And I mean, that was, that was, yeah, that was fun because like this guy is like in his three piece suit, he's in this fancy den, got perfect hair and he's just like <laughs> super into explaining this poem. And, um, and yeah, and there are certain words like that I noticed with the translating software used like friend where I'm like, okay, this would clearly be beloved, you know? Um, but um, yeah, anyways, that was, I just went off on a tangent there, but that was fun. Yeah, no, I, I can totally relate to um, the yeah. hard task of translating poetry and like taking on this massive uh, work of translation. I actually had, um, you know, a bit of a, an experience with translation and poetry. My mom uh, is a poet in Tunisia and she writes in Arabic. And so for my thesis, I was like, you know what, I want to, you know, I see my work as a curator, as a translator as well. So let me just, you know, dive into this task of translating from Arabic to English. And, you know, you know, conceptually it was, you know, to collapse a distance between my mom and me and my mother tongue and English and, you know, my mother and me. And so what ended up happening is so many iteration had to go through translating from Arabic to English because Arabic sometimes like one word can mean four different things. And so trying to do a literal translation is, uh, so counterintuitive because, you know, you really kind of need to preserve the aura of the poem and that only happens through multiple iteration and, you know, asking people and kind of reading out loud and all, and all that shebang. So I really applaud you for, for um, you know, doing this work and, and um, 
Uh, you know, to bring this back to the sound of your voices home uh, and the level of detail that you put um, in um, curating the installation and, and the kitchen, uh, you, it, you're really committed to conscientious representation. And so I want to um, focus on um, this uh, particular uh, installation of the kitchen, and, and here we see many um, you know, objects that you have curated. I would love to know what each object means to you, and um, also, um, you know, can you talk a little bit more about how you curated this installation? Yeah, so uh, first of all, I don't know if Trent Sneed is here, but I just wanted to say thank you to him. Okay, he was the one, <laughs> he made this look easy, like constructing, he works at the Glendale Central Library, but um, so just, I mean, when putting together installations, like having yeah. a good team is this just is like very, very fortunate, but. Behind anyways, the scenes. Uh, so I just wanted to say thanks to him. But um, so with the kind of installations that I do, usually I start by driving around to different thrift stores and, you know, I have a list of like must-haves and other things that just, you know, I'll come across that feel fitting. Um, there were a few things. So, yeah, I got most of the furniture from the local thrift stores. And um, there were a few other objects that came from my kitchen, like certain essentials, like the brass mortar and pestle, which I think all Yemenis have in their kitchen to grind spices. Um, there's like some sem, which is ghee. Clarified butter, also an essential. Uh, when people walk into the space, you know, they would smell a little bit of cumin in the air. Um, and uh, in the back, something that you could kind of easily miss if you were there was this open suitcase that has uh, a few things that we would pretty much always request family bring back from Yemen with them. And that includes that giant jar of honey. Yemeni honey, if you don't know, is the best in the world. Good quality honey is very expensive. That jar would probably be like $200. Um, and uh, coffee and almonds. So, um, so while the installation is like clearly a throwback, it's set, you know, late 70s, early 80s, there are other signifiers of different time periods. So for example, in between the messages, there's you know, different sound effects like a cassette tape rewinding or a more modern voicemail beep, um, ringtone. And then in the messages, you know, some people are uh, recalling memories from over 20 years ago while other people reference very current events. Um, and you know, some people are obviously making a very quick cell phone call. There's you know, one person's driving and you hear the traffic in the background. So I really wanted this to be an experience that kind of subtly goes back and forth in mm -hmm. time. Yeah, and I think you do that brilliantly because you're, as you said, you're kind of asking the audience to just take a moment and be in the past, but also be in the present. And I think that reflection is encouraging us to look for alternative futures. And that's, uh, I think, why this piece is very powerful. One of the ways why this piece is really powerful. Um, so, uh, you know, when our physical bodies can't be with our loved ones because of immigration policies or, you know, being in exile or being a refugee, uh, when we hear their voice, it really pierces through our hearts. Um, and so the sound of your voice's home is one of the first projects where you use sound as the main feature. Uh, and so I would love to know, you know, why you chose this medium to, uh, as a vehicle for memory. Yeah, sound, I definitely consider like the audio and the subtitles as like the main feature of this. Like while the installation is a really important part, I basically kind of consider that to be a very elaborate frame for that. And um, I had been wanting to work on a project where listening played a central role uh, for a while. Like for years I've been a fan of programs like Moth Storytelling or StoryCorps, which if you don't know is a national program where people can sign up to have a conversation recorded and it's archived with the Library of Congress. And you know, so you'll hear sometimes them play clips on NPR and like 30 seconds in I'm crying. So it's like, they're just something about audio that I think hits differently. It's inherently very intimate. You know, sometimes it feels like you can be in the same room with them. Um, you can hear the emotions in a person's voice. Uh, sometimes you can, you know, get a sense of maybe a person's age or hear beautiful accents. And 
I think that, you know, when you can't see who's speaking, that is maybe one less barrier to connectivity. You know, mm -hmm. like we just heard four or five uh, people, you know, who are strangers to most everyone in this room, but I don't think that that is how you would describe them or maybe how you would think of them when you're listening to these really intimate stories. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think really beyond the, the somatic experience of being in the installation, uh, your work has this uh, historical dimension to it in the sense that, um, you know, there has been systemic erasure and damage to the, di the Swanas diaspora's cultural heritage, especially in hegemonic Eurocentric uh, art histories. And so really this makes, you know, documenting and reclaiming our stories a critical task of the time. Uh, and so I'd love to ask you, um, you know, um, can you talk about the archival value of the sound of your voice's home? Yeah, it's, you know, it's funny when we were talking, like I didn't necessarily like think of it as like, oh, this, you know, a, an archival work. But then I was reminded of community-based archives, which I have several friends that work in that field. And, you know, th these are archives that are about a specific community and managed uh, by that community, by members of that community. They're making the choices about what is saved and what is valued. And I think those conversations which are happening a lot right now are really important and I'm sure have affected my own decision in wanting to make a work like this. Um, and the things that I consider really valuable about this are um, like the choices that my contributors made. So I, I pretty much used everything that everyone sent me. Um, there were like a few clips that were, the audio quality was too poor, but so those choices that they made that they deemed, you know, uh, valuable, like that I find valuable too, you know? And like um, that there are, this is a collection of messages where there are different details that are going to be legible to different people, you know? And like not everyone is gonna understand everything or understand the nuances of certain messages or languages and that's okay. And that's kind of like what I find valuable. And, and other details like, you know, um, uh, you know, like that uncle that is like talking to his wife while he's leaving my friend a voice message, you know, he's speaking to her in Arabic, he's addressing my friend in English, <laughs> uh, you know, that kind of dynamic between elders is, and just certain signifiers of diaspora, I find like just really charming and, and important. Um, you know, there's different languages spoken, but there's also different regional dialects. Mm -hmm. And again, like not everyone is going to pick up on that, but, um, but that's that's a huge part of this, you know, like legibility and and that 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 difference among like between how it's going to be received mm -hmm. by people. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for um, building this collection of of sign of precious exchanges and you know documenting how diasporic communities really value time together and, and time apart. And, you know, as we were, we were talking about how this work will evolve and not just, you know, uh, its growth, but also like its afterlife, thinking about its different iterations and uh, where it will be and how different diasporas will understand it and feel it in different spaces and different times. Uh, and so what's really exciting about today's program is everyone in the audience today is invited to uh, record their own uh, exchanges with their families or, or maybe recall, uh, you know, an ancestral tradition that you remember your parents, how they used to communicate. Uh, and, you know, hopefully you feel compelled to contribute to uh, Yes Means ever-evolving body of, of sound bites of, of this uh, beautiful and tender archive. Yeah, I hope you think about it. <laughs> um, so the sound of your voice's home is about distance, it's about movement, it's about connection, and all of which uh, uh, fall under the um, uh, art and migration theme for the Getty Research uh, Institute. And so, you know, I want to take this opportunity to expand on, on your larger body of work uh, and uh, discuss um, how your other work also probe the immigrant experience and ex uh, explore the mediums that you use to tell these stories. Uh, so can you um, t tell us how you relate your collage practice to the immigrant experience? 
Yeah, so I think, you know, for those of us who identify as immigrants or children of immigrants or third culture, uh, which uh, Thisbe had uh, described, um, you know, we often feel like we're hybrids of sorts, and I think that collage is inherently that. You know, you're taking material and images, you know, photography taken by different people of different perspectives, just, you know, source material from all these different places and then cutting them up and forcing them to live together in a way, you know, that they might not seem to make sense together, you know, like, what is 15-year-old Yasmin doing flanked by Peppa from Salt and Peppa and um, a young David Bowie in a floral maxi dress? You know, that might not Makes sense, you know, to anyone, but this, uh, oh, yeah, this somehow was... Baby Yasmin. Yeah, <laughs> that one right there. Baby Yasmin, well, 15 or 16. But, um, but that was like uh, uh, a, a way for me to make sense of, of a convoluted memory I had of the day that I met the man I was supposed to marry. So um, I just found collage to be a much easier way to talk about these areas of tension, um, you know, I'm specifically interested in the experiences of people, you know, whose families migrated from the global south to the global north. And I, you know, there's a specific kind of, I think, tension that a lot of us experience, um, especially as we're growing up. And those kind of conflicting values, I think, are kind of easy to translate with collage. You put a few images right next to each other, and it's, that tension is kind of obvious. Thank you, Yasmin. Uh, so I'm going to share my own immigrant story a little bit. Um, when I actually first saw uh, your installation, uh, I was coincidentally going to um, the Feminist Center for Creative Work to see a pro bono immigration lawyer so we could discuss you know, how um, I can make this a smoother transition. <laughs> um, and so I walk into this room, and I think that was your... Um, exit strategies in, in 2018, um, and I immediately felt a relief. I, I felt, you know, that I had just stepped into my own childhood bedroom. Uh, it was really incredibly uh, comforting to even see, you know, your neon piece that had, you know, Hene bin Tqmada written on it. And I'm not really used to, you know, seeing um, our culture presented in that way in these spaces in contemporary art. So, um, you know, I would love to hear from you. Uh, why do you center home and third culture in your installation work? Yeah, I think, um, you know, for people of diaspora, the concept of home is something that a lot of us, you know, have struggled with or, you know, and kind of continuously reevaluate. And, you know, that's definitely something that I do a lot with my practice um, and continue to do. And when I first started making work about my own background, which is just about five or six years ago, I didn't do it at all before that. I just started by looking around my place and going through old photo albums, like initially to kind of jog my own memory. And then I started using those photos in the collages and then things expanded to installation. And this installation is another recreation of a room in the house, uh, the bedroom that I shared with my sisters when we were teenagers. Uh, so it's kind of set in the 90s. And, you know, it's just like kind of fun retro space. There's a lot of things that I think it were fun for people to interact with because I encouraged them to come into the room and you know play the cassette tapes and CDs and uh, spray the perfumes. But as you you know uh, took a closer look, scattered throughout the room were some framed documents from my files that alluded to the complicated things that were happening in my life and you know reference like the reasons why I ended up being estranged from my family for a really long time and. You know, having this against the backdrop of, of essentially home made it, I think, a lot easier to tell a complete story, you know, because I was really worried about othering myself, but there were things that I really wanted to talk about um, in my work. Um. Oh, yeah. So I really, um, there's a few artists who I really wanted to share that were really influential in my shift to doing installation. This is a piece by an artist named Pepon Osorio. It was at LACMA in a group show called Home, actually. And you'll, you can see it's a split installation. On the right-hand side is a teenage boy's bedroom. It's full of, like, baseball cards and, you know, a bicycle and huge speakers. 
Um, this was in New Jersey where he lived. And then on the other side is a prison cell and his uh, father was in prison at the time. So what Osorio did was he traveled back and forth between the son and the father and he would record a video uh, conversation basically. So like he'd record the son for like five minutes and then he'd go to the prison and record the father and he went back and forth. So they were essentially having this exchange and it was, I mean, just incredibly moving and powerful and just told the story in a way that I could never imagine 2D work doing mm -hmm. it um, in, in such an effective way. So that was really instrumental. And then on the next slide, um, there's a couple of other local artists. That's uh, Genevieve Gagnard on the left, who mines her own background a lot in her work. Mm -hmm. Her talks about her biracial family and upbringing. And she uses collage as well in like very pointed and smart and like cheeky ways. I love her work. Um, and then on the right is Guadalupe Rosales, who also works with archives. She archives um, this LA subculture of a Latino like party and rave scene and has a huge uh, collection of photos and videos um, and like rave flyers. So those are just a, a few people I wanted to share. Thank you. Well, beyond your installation work, you were also cr creating this series of uh, velvet paintings uh, called Soft Powers, in which you depict uh, scenes of all female spaces in your home. Uh, so can you talk about why you choose this medium to tell a more nuanced story about you and your sisters? Yeah, um, so uh, these are burnout pieces. It's, uh, the process is also known as devoray uh, or fiber etching, and the process involves uh, using an acidic paste that's applied to the fabric. Uh, usually it has to be in a composite fabric. So I'm pretty much always using silk rayon velvet and the acid eats away at the rayon, which mm. is the fluffy part wow. of the velvet. So that play between transparency and opacity is something that uh, became really important to me. I was starting to kind of zoom out from like my own specific story and bring in other people. In this case, mostly my sisters, cousins, and a few other like Yemeni American women. And, you know, including other people just made me feel like very protective and, um, you know, uh, being able to choose what is concealed and what is revealed, especially when talking a little bit more broadly about a community that's often demonized, you know, especially mm -hmm. after 9-11, mm -hmm. you know, or all too easily reduced to negative stereotypes. Um, I felt like there was agency in having that kind of control. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have to credit people like um, Fred Moten and Sadia Hartman and Edward Glissant, who've written really eloquently about this, basically like, you know, making the argument that like not all parts of us have to be legible to everyone. They can't mm -hmm. be, you know. Mm -hmm. So and so this series, Soft Powers, um, uh, that's a term that's usually used to describe a diplomatic strategy. And <laughs> um, and I thought it was very fitting. I'm kind of redefining it for this work to uh, kind of honor these skills that many of us develop, like, you know, especially those of us who are raised um, in, yeah, collectivist cultures at home, uh, in communities, uh, you know, broader societies that uh, really prize individualism, you know, independence and, and individual achievement. And I think especially for young girls as they're becoming, you know, adolescents, you know, I think at that age mm -hmm. we feel hyper surveilled, like, you know, universally. But especially if you have are, are, are raised with these competing cultures. Mm -hmm. And so as you're navigating these different spaces, like my community, you know, uh, this tight-knit Yemeni, pretty socially conservative community at home, and then, you know, going to public schools in Chicago and, you know, traipsing around Chicago city streets. I say, these are very different worlds. So we're developing a very special set of skills, you know, to <laughs> navigate these different places. And that's essentially kind of like what this uh, work was about. It's a very powerful series, and I invite you all, if you have the chance to see it up close, there's a very important and delicate tactile feeling to it, to the piece, and um, yeah, it's really powerful. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm sure everyone uh, here is wondering, you know, what's next for Yasmin? Uh, what's, you know, what's happening in, in the next uh, iterations of your projects? I know you are also really um, involved with showing feminist solidarity, and so I'd love to n hear more about those projects that you're 
uh, cooking up. Yeah, I'm really excited about uh, the upcoming projects. I'm uh, really lucky to be working with the team at Oxy Arts, which is uh, the art space managed by Occidental College. Um, it's in Highland Park and uh, with support from La LAN, the Los Angeles Nomadic Division. <laughs> and we're working on a summer exhibition I'll be doing an installation there. We're bringing in other artists and performers. And this exhibition is kind of centered around uh, feminist movements and protests. Uh, we're going to be highlighting activists from different parts of the world and, and how these movements and collectives have informed and inspired each other. Mm. Um, and that opening is June 3rd. And there's going to be some performances that are only going to be that evening. So yes. I really hope uh, you all can come. And, um, uh, and then I am working on a solo uh, exhibition at my gallery, Ochi Projects, in the fall of new textile work. And that work is uh, definitely correlates to the, the work at uh, the summer show at Oxy. So, yeah, I'm super thrilled about all this stuff and I hope you guys can come and okay. say hello. So exciting. I'm definitely going to be there and I hope you all can uh, make uh, the time to go as well. Um, so yeah, thank, thank you so much, Yasmin, uh, for, for everything and for your generosity and for your brilliance. Uh, I'd love to open it up to uh, the audience now for questions. Um, there will be mics uh, coming through by the Getty staff. If you can please speak to the mic, that would be great. Thank you. That was a wonderful. Uh, I really enjoyed that talk very much. I have a question for the both of you. Um, the longer you're in the United States, or you know, the longer you live here, do you feel the bond to your home country lessen, you know, with time, or is it just does it deepen mm. more so? I'll let you answer that. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, that's actually. Um, for me personally, I find that my bond with my home country, Tunisia, has grown even more. I think like it's true, um, the saying that closer, you know, further from the eye, closer to the heart also kind of uh, applies to your home country too. And, um, you know, f finding ways for me to get closer to my home country uh, is very essential. Uh, something like, you know, cooking food or um, listening to music. And also in my curatorial practice as well, I, um, I tend to uh, look at um, art or, or artists that are from the Swana community. And I think that's, that practice is uh, very healing to me and, and helps me get closer um, in building a community here. I think there's something about um, you know, feeling at home wherever you are. And to me, I've, I've found that uh, really through my uh, curatorial practice and through building community with like artists like Yasmin, for example, makes me feel at home. Hmm. That's a really complicated uh, <laughs> question for me. I've never lived in Yemen and I was, I've only been there once. I was born and raised in Chicago, so I've, I've only, I was only there for three months, and, and the reasons for not going are just, that's like, that's a whole, that's a very long, complicated answer. It's like, I, I feel kind of mournful for like an experience in Yemen that I never have had, you know? And um, yeah, I think, kind of feel nostalgic uh, in, in ways that, you know, like I, there's this person I follow on Instagram, for example, he's a Yemeni, you know, chef, and he had this trip. He went to Yemen, and was and was posting all these stories, uh, uh, just these adventures that he had. And I'm like, I'm never going to have that adventure. Part of it was because he's a man, you know. So there are certain things that he did in places that he went, and you know, that's like I, I shared it with some other Yemeni friends, and we just all had the same feeling. It was like, you know, they're like late at night going to buy fish and taking it to a market and going in the kitchen, and that's how I like to travel. And it's like we would never have that experience there. So uh, anyways, yeah. <laughs> 
Any other questions? Do I see hands over there? Hi, Yasmin. Um, I relate to you a lot. Um, I'm the child of um, immigrant parents also, and I was born and raised in Chicago. And I've only been to my home country um, twice, and the last time wasn't so recent. So I was wondering, um, it's kind of like a two-part question. How do you, like, are there ways or, like, are there things you do to, like, feel closer to, like, your culture and, like, your home country? Um, well, kind of like Ikram, it's like, um, when I started making work that reflected my background, um, because before that period, living in L.A., um, I think my sister was here, uh, like, we, we're at least where we have been or where we've worked, we didn't encounter like a lot of Arabs necessarily. And then I started making this work, which um, attracted a certain kind of, you know, other Arabs and Yemenis or people of Solana culture. And like you were describing, it's like these people are part of a new kind of of home, a new community. You know, it's like those of us that feel kind of like black sheep, I guess. It's like, oh, we found each other, <laughs> <Yeah>. you know? <laughs> like you make this work and you tell the story and, you know, initially it felt so risky and I was like really scared and it felt very vulnerable, but then it was like, oh, then, then these people start coming out of the woodwork that's like, I get you, you know? And so now it's like, um, oh, like Amani who's here, like she's part of, uh, you know, this this new, like, these other Yemenis that I didn't know growing up, but I would have loved to have known. Like I grew up before the internet really, you know, and Instagram, <laughs> and there wasn't a way to find each other. But now there's all these, you know, groups and collectives. And so if you feel, for people who feel alone or like struggling with those tensions that I talked about, it's like there are ways of connecting. And it's like I have a, like, because of these new friends, um, I have just a newfound appreciation for like our own culture. Can you Over speak here. a little bit about um, your art as a form of education and the sort of um, positive side of that and maybe the burden? So like as an artist, you want to make work that, like you were saying earlier, you don't maybe have to explain, but then there's a part of it where actually to give explanation to people helps uh, expand understanding of a culture, of uh, an ex excuse me, an experience, et cetera. Yeah, um, you know, when I made that first series of uh, collages, which was like the very first autobiographical work, um, and it was just like six pieces, I had so much trepidation around it too, because I was telling some kind of complicated stories, and I, I accompanied that work with a a little zine that had a really long disclaimer in it because when, <laughs> you know, I was like, I know I'm probably the first person of Yemeni background that, you know, who, that a lot of people are encountering in, in terms of art. And so I felt like I had a lot of explaining to do because I'm also talking about some experiences that involve like some negative stereotypes, which just happen to also be true, you know? So it's like, and, and at the time I made that work, the war in Yemen, I think was like three years in, and, and I really felt obligated to mention the war. Um, because A, so many people had no idea it was happening, you know, still is going on, and that the U.S. is very much, in, you know, has a huge hand in it. So it's like, you, there is always feels, I think, um, this obligation when you have a certain background to inform. It's, it's unfair, but it's just true. And so I thought like, I have this platform, let me just also be like, FYI, this is happening. And you know, the US has a huge role and we're making money off of it. And um, so yeah, it is kind of a burden. And, and you know, I think it's part of the reason why I'm like, I'm thinking about maybe making my work more abstract or a little less legible. So like, I wanted to do that work and it was very intentional to just kind of say like, this is where I'm coming coming from when I talk about these other issues later. It's like I knew I wanted to make that transition from like very autobiographical to kind of zooming out, which is what's happening now with the work. Yeah. Thanks for that question. There was a question here. Excuse me. Um, so you mentioned uh, uh, pre-internet connecting with people and like this post-internet connecting with people and talked about the ways in which we can connect. And in your 
exploration of all of these audio clips, did you see any threads of how connecting has changed over time and using different mediums for connecting and what that does to like the actual like intimacy of that type of connection? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, now there's just a much broader variety, you know, it's like before we were very intentional, there were these long poetic intros, none of that's happening, you know, anymore, it's just <laughs> getting right into it, you know, I mean, I know a lot of my f other friends, uh, Arab friends, like they're getting all kinds of just quick uh, overly sentimental, <laughs> you know, uh, like uh, kind of memes, lots of roses, uh, um, you know, the quick, like, what are you doing? Why haven't you called me? And then the 40 minute, you know, <laughs> like confessional. So I think now it's just, it's all over the place, which I think is really, is really lovely. And yeah, but, and yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll add something to, uh, to that. For me, like recently, you know, um, you know, FaceTime is really amazing because now I can just call my parents and, and use FaceTime. Uh, but then, like, I'm like, well, FaceTime is going to be gone, right? Like, it's gone after you hang up. And so I just kind of screen record um, the, the recording and then I, and I go back and kind of look at, like, what, uh, what you know, because sometimes you would just put the phones and be having dinner or, like, be dancing or, you know, there's a party happening. So um, that's one of the ways that I found is, like, good to keep a record of those shared uh, intimate moments with my family. Go ahead. Hi, I have a, I'm back here, I have a question. Oh. Um, here. Oh. Um, and, and it's interesting because I think it, it goes to both of you. Um, you coming from Tunisia, Ryan, um, migrating to the US and you being born here, I'm from Brazil, I've been living in the US for the past 15 years, and I'm, it's fascinating, your work, it's mean, and I'm kind of um, wondering, right, when we see neighborhoods in LA, in, in so many cities, um, in Queens, right, in New York, or you mentioned Chicago, and you see those hubs of different countries happening, right, within those neighborhoods, and I wonder, um, it took me six years or more to feel kind of more adapted to the culture and the values from the US and I wonder those uh, pockets of different nations that happens within neighborhoods or I wonder how how do we adapt right we have we created this kind of a small home world, uh, world within those neighborhoods and what is exactly to be connected to home but also have a sense of connection with the new country that you're living in, right? And I think both of you might have different experiences from being born somewhere else and being here or being born in the US and have a family, right, and ties to, to another country. So I wonder at which moment, what is adaptation then to the new country that we are in? Or how do we do that, right? Or can we do that? Maybe not fully. I'm just wondering if you have, both of you have kind of some comments regarding that. Do you want me to start? Yeah, can you start? Um, I don't necessarily know the answer to that, but I know that like, for some of us, I think maybe especially my generation and, and our specific community, it's definitely, it's challenging. Um, I think, you know, uh, I can just speak to like the, the being the product of like, you know, a community or parents that kind of struggled with like, okay, what, how do we adapt? Because something that's really interesting that I experience and have learned with other children of immigrants of, of all different backgrounds, what often happens is that when like the elders are so concerned about the children losing their culture, uh, so the culture that they, um, and the time that they're immigrating in kind of crystallizes, you know, and sometimes the thoughts and, you know, social norms like aren't progressing with the times. And this is something that I've uh, heard, yeah, I just had other friends kind of confirm like when they go back to visit their homeland, they're talking differently, like their friends or family there are saying like, we've moved on, why are you guys still thinking like this? This is so backwards. And that I know is definitely, there's a sentiment among like a lot of Yemenis that like you're frozen in like 1976, like what's going on, <laughs> you know? So um, yeah. 
Yeah, I don't. I think it's like some some combination, some way of like not, at least with with the children, like not being too restrictive because they're they're gonna, you know, many of us will rebel, but like. Having like being of the community, but retaining your culture, you know, I don't think I think like back in the day there was a lot of maybe too much assimilating, and I think that had a lot to do with like what the culture was in the u s at the time. People didn't feel so welcome to embrace their culture, but now things are so different, and it's really, really wonderful to see you know even you know second, third, fourth gen people really embracing their culture mm-hmm. their 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 you know uh, of their of their family, but also being of the community here. But yeah, I'm sure you have a very different experience. Um, yeah, no, it's very uh, similar to me. I was having that thought as well in, in terms of like when I meet um, friends here that, you know, I immigrated to the U.S. like 13 years ago, so recently, I guess. Um, and so for me, um, you know, I didn't necessarily like want to meet people from Tunisia right away. I just wanted to have friends from all over the world. And I think that's the beauty of coming to the U.S. is um, the opportunity of meeting people from all over the world. And I, I treasure that so much. And all my friends come from everywhere. Uh, but yeah, when I started meeting uh, friends from the Swana community, it was always like a, an interesting interesting interaction where we're like, well, you know, this is very different now. It's not like that. Or they're like, oh my gosh, you are so different than like the people here, you know? And then, to me, that was just like a reflection of what you said. Um, but I think now it's, we're at a time where we really want to be connected with one another. We really want to embrace our culture. And, uh, and I think there's a, more of that like tolerance and understanding that I think is really beautiful. Uh, one more question. Hello. Hi. This is a much um, lighter question, um, <laughs> but I've uh, been following your work for at least 15 years, Ooh. a little bit more, but I've noticed that, um, you know, through watercolors and oils and photo abstracts to resin to, gosh, collages and then textiles and installations, like, there's a very serious undercurrent to all of it, like your story as a whole, you know? So what, what do you like to do for fun? What, what, how do you, you know, like in, in terms of like not getting so overwhelmed by the subject matters that you deal with, how do you keep it light? How do you infuse lightness and fun into what you do and in your personal life? Thanks, Charlene. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I mean, like the collage, uh, I find like inherently like um, has a lot of levity to it. Like, you know, that first series of work, um, uh, like the, the meaning behind a lot of those pieces is like c- quite serious. But I think when you look at them, I, I think you can, you can read some of the levity to it. And like, I, that was one of the reasons why I liked uh, using collage, um, you know, as well, because uh, like humor has always been a strategy to kind of deal with things. Like humor played, a, I think, a big role in, you know, comedy <laughs> in, our, in our household. Um, but, but yeah, just... Um, uh, working on on different kinds of projects too. Like I I sometimes work on the, the, I have a collage series that involves a lot of plants. And even though I'm just like using f- photography and cutting up images of plants, like I found that to be like so much more soothing than some of the other work that I was doing. I'm like, oh my god, like this is nice. Like I think I need to like intersperse, you know, <laughs> some of the heavier autobiographical stuff with different kinds of work, and then. Um, the installation that's going to be at Oxy Arts, like that one, it, while again has like more like serious undertones, like there, there was a lot of fun in putting that together. So just to say a little bit about it, it's like a bedroom disco, you know, there's techno music playing the whole time and there's a rose gold, rose gold um, disco ball in it. And, you know, so like I'm, I'm definitely like leading more towards like, okay, how do I make things like more fun? I've gotten like some serious things like out of the way, but... Yeah, thank you for your question. Well, thank you so much, Yasmin and Ikram, for such a wonderful conversation. Thank Everybody, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Thank you.
Thank you so much.